Welcome everybody. My name is Bob Holland. I am with the Autodesk Inventor Support Group and we're going to be going over um, performance optimization for Inventor for this option. Um, if anybody else is on the line, they more than welcome put themselves on mute. All right, so we'll get started here. What we're going to cover is uh, obviously the introduction, the technical support, how to access it. Uh, previous webinars were what's new in 2016 and R2 and R3. My last one was uh, Inventor configuring Inventor 2016. We'll be covering some of that again here um, because the configuration of Inventor 2016 does make a big difference for um, large assemblies. So and then we're going to go over how to check the information that you have on your machine, um, what really is a large assembly, um, how to find out what your driver dates are and other hardware details. And then uh, we're going to go in and talk about configuring Inventor specifically for large assemblies. All right. This is our webinar series uh, schedule. The first two have been done. Today is March 2nd, so we're right in the middle. The next one, the April 13th, is going to be what's new in Inventor 2017. All right, so we're gonna, the purpose of this is for configuring Inventor for large assemblies and how to really optimize your performance. And uh, these are people that are gonna be using Inventor for large assemblies or you're planning on implementing it for large assemblies. If you have questions that you would like to ask on your GoToWebinar panel, you can ask your questions there. Uh, we have somebody on staff that will be uh, trying his best to answer your questions. If and I'll try to leave time at the end to answer any questions that haven't been addressed. All right, how to access technical support. One of the first points of reference would be our knowledge network. And our knowledge network, uh, as we answer questions from customers, we create articles and these articles are published and will allow you to search them. Uh, Google's also a good place to start for that. Um, the other is product forums, like our Inventor Forum. That is a good place to ask people for hardware specs. Um, thinking about buying such and such a computer or video card, and this is what I do for a living. Um, you'll, you'll get a wide audience for that. We can't generally give any product specifications um, other than our system requirements for legal reasons on that regard. Uh, the next is the... Hey Bob, Bob yes. sorry, this is Tom. Uh, your uh, slides are not uh, rolling. They are not? You're stuck on a welcome screen. Apologize, I just want to let you know. Okay. Here they go. Yep, are we back? They're going now. All right. <laughs> you're, you're fine Thank now, you. thanks. Okay, so... We're going, we went over the uh, Knowledge Network product forums, installation licensing blog. The nice thing about the installation licensing blog there, there is a button. It's called the uh, Ask Virtual Agent. In there, you can get access to another source for downloads of products. So that's a place that's... Uh, isn't hit as often and is sometimes easier to get to. Um, all right. The next are just our general blogs. So here is the new uh, knowledge network. So we have the support and learning customer service and community. So you can act, get easy access to a wide variety of options in one location. For one-on-one -on -one support, you can place a request. You'd have to log into accounts.autodesk.com. And when you're there, 
you can get the 800 number to call us and we will um, call you back frequently we're on the phones vast majority of the time so it's difficult to reach us initially so a best option log the call give us your information and we'll call you back just as soon as we can um, one of the tools that we use for support is uh, team viewer here's a uh, location where you can uh, get the team viewer applet so that uh, when we are setting up and allow us allow you to show us your system so we can better understand what's going on okay we're going to go over the uh, system configurations what defines like a large assembly how to check your information hardware uh, details and then we'll go over the configurations okay now system requirements this is linked to our 2016 system requirements these our these are generally on the right our minimum recommendations this is for inventor running doing small models you can do quite a bit with this so it's not a problem there and uh, if you want to get into more um, larger models we recommend the well the recommended uh, configuration that you see there uh, this one is for our large assemblies and I'll be going over that in more detail the uh, and why we recommend a, a number of different items so my laptop is Windows 8.1 um, got an i7 24 gigs of memory I have two uh, solid state hard drives in it uh, both of them are 500 gigabytes one is dedicated just for um, support uh, cases and uh, in there I've got a uh, Quadro uh, K2000M video card. What is a large assembly? A large assembly can, is typically 3,000 to 5,000 occurrences of parts. And you may have anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 parts in there. Occurrence is like a bolt. You have this one bolt in this assembly. Well, the example here is eight times. So you got one bolt occurring eight times. So takes up less memory when we have eight of one item and we only have to refer to one and then we just copy them around. Inventor assemblies can get very large and you need to be aware as things grow, your hardware resources need to grow with them. So we can do up to like 50,000 occurrences of uh, 10,000 unique parts. Now, this particular one is 962 parts and has 2,026 occurrences in there. So these are different examples of things that people have done with Inventor and gives you the occurrence and parts counts so that you can have an understanding as to what might be there okay if you're really looking at a large doing large assemblies you're going to want to put as much into your box as you can um, for resources this is a recommendation for large assemblies and we have many people go above and beyond that all right how do you check what you have in your system if you right mouse click on my PC and go to properties it's going to give you um, a dialog box it's going to show you what your operating system is and a few of your basic um, pieces of information OS RAM system then you can open up the device manager and then you can get more detailed information in there say like your video card um, right now it has the driver's date and the version we recommend 
the latest performance driver for your video card. And as we go in, I'll explain to you why that's what we're recommending. The other is the um, DX Diag. Now this works really well when you have a single video card. If you have dual video cards, it is typically going to, if you've got one built in the motherboard, that's the video card that it is going to show you. So if you've got a laptop that has an Intel on the motherboard and say an NVIDIA or AMD um, auxiliary card, DX Diag is going to show you your Intel video card information. If you've got two cards, we recommend you keep both of the video drivers up to date because they work in conjunction with each other unless you've gone into the BIOS and completely disable one of them. So that's one of those things that is frequently overlooked is keeping that Intel driver up to date also. Okay, DXDiag is going to show you your um, basic system information. Then if you click on the display tab, it's going to show you your driver date version, some other system information that's available. All right, MS info, the MS Info 32, which will allow us to get system information from your system. Now, when we're doing troubleshooting for different reasons from customers, these, this is information that we get. It gives us a lot of information regarding the system. Um, many of the applications that are installed. It also gives us um, events that the machine has recognized down at the bottom. So there's even a section in there that uh, is labeled problem devices. So we can even see if the system has devices in there that may be relevant to the problem that's being exhibited. Okay. When you are in here, it'll show you a lot of the same information. If you have multiple video cards, it's going to show you both video cards. So that's the video, if the machine has multiple video cards, we'll ask for the NFO file, so that way we can see the information regarding both video cards. And if you, we ask for the NFO file, you're going to want to be on the system summary, and then under file, then you can export that out as an F, NFO and uh, get that to us. All right. So the other is Inventor Diagnostics. This is something that we frequently ask for, and very often what we get is a screen capture of this dialog. Um, that's not what we're looking for. The key there is the very bottom line. It says click OK, and what it's going to do is paste a bunch of information in the paste buffer. Then you can go over to Notepad, paste it in there, save it out, and that's what we're looking for as opposed to just this. This is just the top couple of lines or the whole file of information that's there. And one of the things you might want to do is uh, as you go through and you're looking, do these. See what the information's there so that way you understand um, what you're sending. Nothing's really proprietary. Um, it's good diagnostics information that we're requesting. Okay. Operating system for large assemblies. You want to use a 64-bit OS. 32-bit OSs had a, by default, you could get two gigabytes per application. So you could do a um, four gigabyte switch in the, um, boot up, that helped a little, but starting at 2016, we're only supporting 64-bit OSs across our product line. It, they're readily available, and that basically gives us almost an unlimited amount of memory space. So and it's a larger pipeline to get information in and out of the system internally. CPUs for Inventor. Inventor for, is predominantly a single-threaded application. That means 
it's kind of single tasking as opposed to multitasking. It's, we've got a few portions of it that will use multiple processors. So things that will do that, animation, rendering, task scheduler, ray tracing, drawing view calculations, and stress analysis. So the thing, if you're actually going out specking machines, you're going to want to go out in your budget, have that in mind. You're going to want to go out and get the fastest processor that you can get. You can get a dual uh, processor. That's great. The thing is that if you're getting two processors, be aware that Inventor is going to be able to access all access all of them, but the operating system will. So we can put Microsoft Access on the other on another processor. It can do Outlook. It can Microsoft will allow other applications to run over there, giving you more resources strictly for Inventor. If <clears throat> you're finding that uh, the system's a little slower, you might want to get out of some of your your auxiliary applications like uh, Outlook, Word, Excel, those types of things, um, even though you're not doing a lot, like Outlook updates in the background by default. So just an FYI. Okay, task scheduler is one of those things that is used a lot for purposes of migration. By default, it is set up to use one processor. For me, I have like 16 cores available. What I do is I'll set Inventor to use 15. I also, because as I'm running the test scheduler in the background on other stuff, I will not give all of my memory to it. I'll allow it to take, say, three cores of my memory and then at that point, I'll do my migration. Now, if you're just having this run overnight and it's the only thing you're doing, give it all the resources. It just makes it faster, more efficient. Video cards. There's pretty much the big three. NVIDIA, AMD, Intel. Intel isn't what, by default, the, for high end. The you want a CAD workstation quality graphics card when you're working with um, large assemblies. Because what we've done is we tune our code to make as much use of these high end video cards as is possible for making your experience better. Now, with that, we push these cards real hard. We used to have, and we still do, certified graphics drivers. At one time, these this was really important. Not so much anymore. With the Microsoft sending out updates for .NET, Several times a month, each .NET update has the opportunity to break a video card driver. So there's just no way we can keep up on the certified drivers. Our rule of thumb is if you're experiencing video um, anomalies, go out, get the latest video driver for, or latest performance video driver for your video card. There's a link there to a um, knowledge base article that has uh, links to um, AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel. So that way you can go out, get the latest HQL uh, performance drivers for your video card. And it don't recommend using the certified drivers unless it's like real early in the season. If your driver is more than six months old, we recommend that you update it anyway. All right, RAM. For all intents and purposes, the more the merrier. Um, 
particularly if you are running some of your lower end video cards, you'll notice that as you go in and if you were to um, save out the DXDIAG information, it's going to show you that it has shared memory. What that does is it's saying your video card has a little bit of video RAM on it, then it's going to use system memory. So if you have an 8 gig, a machine with 8 gigs of RAM, and your video card's allowed to take up to 3 gigs of that RAM, then you are at some point potentially going to restrict your the whole system to 5 gigs of RAM. Well, the thing is, as soon as that system needs more RAM, you're out. Pretty soon, you're going to be using hard drive space for paging for RAM. You don't want to use hard drive uh, speed for video RAM. So you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, if you start paging, then you're going to really, you're going to want to add RAM to your system. So laptops. When you're thinking about buying a laptop, this is the video card and RAM are things that are hard to replace or add to a laptop. The reason being is they tend to be more or less proprietary for that laptop. So video cards, highly unlikely. You can sometimes add more RAM, but they only manufacture the RAM for that laptop while that laptop is in production. As soon as that laptop is out of production, which is usually about six months, that RAM for that machine tends to no longer become available. So cost and demand, if you are uh, need more RAM, then you are going to have, um, you'll pay more for it. Some suggestions for the amount of RAM that you have for different uh, size assemblies. And this is based on, if you are opening up uh, two assemblies, two big assemblies, and they're dissimilar, you've got a lot of extra stuff being loaded. So you need to take that in consideration. Okay, we have an application, it's called Memprobe. This is gonna allow you to see how your system is running via memory. So here's an example dialog box, and it give you a an idea as to um, how you're doing on your RAM for while you have your inventor open and see if you are needing to get additional RAM. Okay, virtual memory. Now, uh, sorry, visual effects, then we'll go over virtual memory. Now for visual effects, um, if you set in the system properties and go to advanced, hit uh, performance settings, you're going to see that Windows has said it wants to choose um, for the best visual fidelity, typically. Um, what I recommend is that we turn off a lot of that and just set uh, just a couple. The biggest one there is show thumb thumbnails instead of icons. Um, that shows you basically the thumbnail of the um, file instead of just a regular generic icon for the extension. And smooth edges just to make things more readable at times. All right, if you go over to the virtual memory and you need to make sure that under the performance options, the biggest thing there is it's set to programs and not background services. Background services are set for mostly like server application or server machines. The button down at the bottom will allow you to change your paging file. For Windows XP and prior, this was pretty important. Windows does a pretty good job on this, so we generally just have it allow to manage for all of the drives. Now, hard drives. What is on there? 
you've got your operating system, your applications data, and a bunch of temporary information that you're working on. Now, as we're previously, what we've done is we've kind of separated them onto uh, multiple hard drives so that you may have your OS and applications on one and maybe your temp there and then your data on another. Now, when we go through and when you have Inventor, things like uh, temp data, we really won't, we don't want to put things out on the network for performance purposes. In fact, uh, one person that I was talking to, he actually created a RAID of SSDs, and that was just lightning fast. Um, just great performance. Um, that is an option. Uh, it's not a cheap option, but it's a good option. Things like this, you need to think ahead of time for how you're going to uh, access your items. So SSDs, these are becoming much more predominant. Solid state hard drives. What it is, is it's basically RAM. You don't have to, you have no moving parts. They tend to fail fewer times. You, all electromechanical devices will eventually fail. Uh, solid state, about the only thing that tends to kill solid state is heat. So you need to make sure that that's, you're doing good there. Now, your throughput, much greater on solid state. And when I did a performance test for purposes of like starting Inventor from a solid state hard drive to a regular 7,500 RPM um, SATA drive, it was taking almost a minute and a half, sometimes more, depending on which version of Inventor, um, to start off a solid state hard drive. It dropped it to about a half a minute. Uh, the other thing is, is inventor network licensing that plays a part in there too. So you need to be aware of that. Um, networking environment, um, things that we've done in the past to make things faster is keeping everything on a local machine. One of the ways of doing that is using vault. Vault is available to all users it for free. It's there. It's, you can use it. What this does is you check files in and out, but when you check everything out, it comes onto your local hard drive. So nothing's necessarily out on the network. So when you're working, all of your pertinent files are on your machine, just like you would if you were a single user. Then you're done, you check it back in, and works really well. Now, if you need to put things on the network, Set the machines up so that you're running full duplex, which means that you can read and write simultaneously. Do not let it um, auto detect for the speed. S manually go in and put that. We've seen instances where the cards are waffling. So what happens is the machine and the switch talk back and forth and they're they spend a lot of time auto renegotiating speeds. You lock it in on the on the card. As long as the switch can handle it, that's what it's going to do. So you're better off with that. Okay. The other is Inventor uses segmented loading. So what this is, we load the file in segments. We write the file in segments. If you've ever got a segmentation error, that's because on a subsequent write, the write failed on a segment. This usually causes corruption. Never recommend you opening or saving to thumb drives. Bad practice can cause corrupted files. 
and once you've introduced a corrupted file, once you get a segment viol segmentation violation or a segmentation error, you're really just going to have to go back to a previous version or a backup. There's no recovery from that. So just to let you know that the, the, our files are done in segments. So I've explained a couple of things that can happen there. So it was FYI. Okay. For the IT folks, switches, um, you want one gigabit full duplex. Um, you want to set everything full bore. You also want to take all of your engineering folks and if you can put them on a separate switch. So you don't want more than two hops from the user to the server they're getting their data from. If you can put the server they're getting data from on the same switch as the users, so you can segment all of their uh, traffic, good practice. Network cards, we already talked about uh, one gigabit, full duplexing, turn off the auto detect. Um, the data servers, um, you're, that's going to be based on experience and what you need, what the, the load is expected to be. You'll need to keep an eye on it. Um, if you're seeing that the um, network usage on the server is reaching about 40%, you're going to want to start upgrading the server to allow for more um, utilization. Yeah, once you we found that once you start hitting about 40%, then your prospect for drop packets, things like that, can go up. Okay. As you go through and you're maintaining the machines, video card drivers we talked about. Also, pay attention to network card drivers. You also, things that can uh, play a part in that uh, CMOS and other motherboard drivers. Um, just have to pay attention. So as things start, if you start having a problem, check to make sure that your drivers are up to date for those kinds of issues. We've seen a wide variety of issues from unusual sources. Okay, security, antivirus. This impacts your performance. If you can get away with it, go in, put exceptions for all of our files. We have white papers that are out there that will allow you to, to show what extensions we have. If you can set it for just executables, that's great. Um, turn off any unneeded uh, services because that will allow more memory available for your users. Um, you want to minimize the number of background applications, um, particularly if you're looking at uh, heavy, large applications. And we've had experiences where, you know what, I need to get this done. Turn off Outlook and tends to be a big resource hog. You, you, as soon as it's out, it frees up a lot more system resources. And um, depending on how fast, how often you have it, go check for updates. Can make a bit difference on your uh, bandwidth usage also. Okay, task manager, good place. You can go in, see what your usages are. It shows you memory availability, um, what's being used at any single point in time. If you go in there under options, you can actually add a few additional columns when you're in the details. So one of the things I turn on is like uh, IO, um, so I can see how things are working. Okay, inventor projects, okay. The key here 
is you set your workspace where you having to maximize your performance you want everything on your local machine that's where vault helps on that because everything's on your local machine the things that you need to be aware of talk to the IT staff to make sure that we don't have certain locations that are um, being shadow backed up or shadow copied so that will also cause potential issues for you um, vault helps for maximizing your performance uh, for large assemblies. In application options, the undo folder. This is usually in your user profile. It's part of your temp space. Make sure that these locations are not being redirected to network locations because sometimes they are and that will impact. You think you're going to your C drive but your IT staff have redirected you to writing over on network location that will impact your um, performance. So in here you can enable um, quick opens and it caches, you have the option to cache the last um, open assembly because what we found is when you exit Inventor, about 50% of the time or more, you're going back and reopening the file that you were last using. So good way of speeding up opening your next one if it was your last one. Okay. Show, show command prompting. The, the less we have Inventor showing you, for different prompts, the faster things will run. Um, undo file size. This is really, it allows you to undo back. Now, if you've ever um, brought in, imported large step file, I just file, sometimes it'll ask you to, it's going to prompt you for a larger undo file. Well, the reality is that you can't undo an import. So to speed things up, if you set this to zero for your undo, it's going to prompt it immediately. Do you want to uh, resize it? Tell it no. Then it's not going to save any of that undo on your import and speed things up. Okay. Optimize selection, these are suggestions. Application colors to speed up the ability for your video card, recommend a single color background and not an image um, or the gives you an option for like a gradient pattern if it's a single color speeds things up pre highlighting and enhanced highlighting obviously you uncheck both of those those will help speed things up also okay your view transition time um, if you set it to zero speed things up frame rate settings um, disabling the automatic refinement will also help. If you set your display quality to rough, then that also speeds things up. Uh, you can also turn off the 3D indicator and the XYZ labels. So that makes things easier or it's showing you less information that needs to keep up to date. Okay. Obviously, in the display appearances, the more you have it keep track of, the more it's going to uh, cost you in performance. So hardware, this is the settings for your video card. We recommend setting it to performance. So that way you're 
basically going to maximize your performance. It, what that does is it's going to basically turn off anti-aliasing. If you set it to quali quality, it's going to turn on your anti-aliasing. Your lines will look smoother, but um, at a performance cost. And if you're set to conservative or if you're set to software graphics, big performance hits there. And back to the inventor diagnostics and how you can uh, check some of that information. And if we need any assistance, you can get that, if, that to us. Okay. Drawing options. Um, turn off, retrieve model dimensions on view placement. That way you don't have to be prompted for those. Same with line weights um, for your um, previews. If you just show a bounding box, it doesn't have to keep that um, preview. It just shows you the bounding box for that makes it easier. Um, enabling background updates will run those in the background. Um, you definitely want to turn off memory saving mode. So, okay. Auto projecting edges when you start sketch, um, turn that off so that way it doesn't, uh, you, if you want to project, you tell it what you want to project. Um, defer updates, if you do that for your assemblies, that will speed things up. You need to be aware that this, this will speed things up, but the updates will be deferred. So you need to make sure that before you save it, that you get everything all straightened out. And, but if you're doing a, a large series of changes, and you've got it all organized, this will speed things up. Express mode. Express mode allows Inventor to add images into your assembly to allow you to easily open the assembly and get the visual fidelity of the assembly so that you can do measurements live a lot of different items in the assembly. If you need to actually modify it, you'll have to load it full. But in the express mode, what it does is it uh, you set it to how many unique occurrences of parts that you have in a model before it's going to um, start adding the express mode items in there. Now, the one of the items with the express mode is it makes your assemblies larger. If you have people that are coming in via VPN and trying to load a model and you've got express modes, it's gonna take maybe a 500K assembly and it can make it as much as 20 megs or even more. So it just so that you're aware that those images get excuse me, embedded into the assembly so that uh, depending on how everybody's accessing the server, it can be faster, slower, but this way you'll know. Okay, in assemblies, you want to resolve all constraint errors. If you've got constraint errors, open up all the sub-assemblies, get them straightened out, then go to the main assemblies and work your way from the bottom up, making sure these are all um, resolved. Every error that we have, we have to work our way through. It causes issues. Okay, working geometry, um, work planes, work axis. If you can go in and turn off all of these, so it's less information we have to keep track of. Makes a difference. Complex features like coils and springs. And um, you'll, we see a lot of folks getting um, 
items off of third-party vendors. Um, MasterCard is a good example. You can uh, get features off there. They'll actually have a helical cut coil thread for that's on their feature. Visually, looks stunning. Computationally, it's going to cost you. So that's why our threads are a visual representation of a thread as opposed to an actual helical cut coil thread. Every face of every part of every assembly, we have to keep track of. And as they vary, it gets more complex. The other item is you want to keep all of your geometry within 100 meters of the origin. If you have something that's stuck out in space, it greatly complicates the math. We know where it is in association to the origin, but as you get further from the origin, you can cause all sorts of problems. Um, up to visual problems because things get really pretty wonky. So one of the things we usually do if we people call up there it's like, eh, these parts in the assembly just aren't working like we'd expect them to work. And you go in and you start look where they are associated to the origin. And it's like, yeah, I got this small part that's stuck out in the middle of Never Never Land. And we keep track of where that origin is. Well, they bound it in there, but that origin's now way long ways away from the assembly origin. We need to make sure that you get all of that organized. Uh, greatly impacts your um, performance. The other is known limitations, <clears throat> like uh, you may have a small um, arc that may have a very, very large radius. These can also impact how we, we have to keep track of all the calculations because it's all math, ones and zeros on the back end. So we got to keep track of it. It's all done via math. The larger we make these numbers, the more complex the math is, the slower we go. So the other is um, if you're importing your geometry from third-party vendors, check it. You bring in a bad part into your assembly. It's just like adding a bad part to your machine. It's eventually going to come back to haunt you. So make sure, I mean, Sometimes it's better to, it's like, well, here's a really complex part that's got problems. It's going to take me two hours to um, give me a, another model that's a lot less complicated that I can use. That might be better. Or you go back to the manufacturer and say, this model isn't coming in real clean. Can I get another copy? Um, ask for a SAT file. See if you can... They can provide that for you. So, all right. Um, standard parts obviously don't change. Uh, so you can add those into your project library folders. Um, that way you can get to and from pretty easy. Going back to express mode, um, the optimization performance is great for visual. I mean, you can cut the load time by 20%, particularly if you're going in and just needing to get information from the model for somebody else. Good option there for opening larger assemblies. So the other is when you open it, you can give it the different representations that you want to um, provide. Level of detail. the less detail that we have to present. So you've got a, uh, here's a uh, engine. So what we did was shrink wrap it, get rid of a lot of the hidden parts, small parts, get rid of it. Visually looks the same, has the same um, mounting connection points, so on and so forth. But we reduced it from 804 occurrences to 368 and um, 120 unique parts. The other is um, you can do shrink wrap substitutes. So what it is is you end up uh, taking an assembly 
and turning it into a single part so you can fill in so it's just a, a solid rather than uh, okay well this is a shell has a bunch of internal stuff well we don't care about the internal stuff we just need to see how it mounts how it is we gives us a visual representation for what we need and it turns it into like this example rather than 27 um, parts it's one so makes things pretty easy there low times much more simplified it helps for when we're, when you're doing a wide variety of items so that uh, basically you, we don't worry about any of those internal components because they don't exist. If they're there, we actually have to keep track of them. So we're t you're telling us that there's less information that we have to keep track of. All right, so we're going to open this up. Uh, Don, how am I doing on time? Uh, you got about nine minutes, Bob. Okay. Um, how are we doing on questions? I haven't even looked. Uh, it's about one one left here. I've got to get two. Okay. Well, then uh, what we'll do is if you want to answer that, and then what we'll what I can do is I can give you guys a little bit of time left in your day. All right, uh, so we'll leave it at that. And thank you all very much for joining us. We'll get this posted and emailed out to everybody. All right, thank you much.